All right, welcome back to the Robo Show. Uh, I'm your host, Chad Robo Show, and I'm, I'm here with uh, Matt from uh, from Leatherneck for Life. If you follow, uh, if you're on Instagram, you have to follow Leatherneck for Life, especially if you're a United States Marine, uh, past or present, you got to follow it. Uh, they, they have pretty pretty uh, large following, 63,000 followers. Uh, Matt runs a uh, clothing company, but Leatherneck for Life clothing companies, company. So if you want any cool Marine Corps gear uh t-shirts and stuff like that uh really great place to go and uh and he also has a uh podcast and moving into second season now outside the wire which is on spotify you can find both of those on, a, on his uh instagram yeah, he has a, a link tree uh outside of the outside of what he's doing now mac was a 0331 for those who don't know it's a machine gunner uh in the marine corps uh, he was a sergeant and iraq veteran combat action uh ribbon and uh, purple heart and uh, you know, transitioned out, and has done a really good job of, uh, of with his company and Left Neck for Life. I've been following for for him for a while. Uh, he has some hilarious posts that I share quite quite a bit of, and uh, and so hey man, uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, tell us about uh, you know where you started, uh, where you started in the Marine Corps to coming to you know starting your own company and. and during that transition, why, why you decide to start your own, your own thing? Yeah, so uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, as most of us do, we kind of try to figure out what to do next. Um, there's not a lot of opportunities for machine gunners in the civilian world. Um, I, I searched extensively and came up uh, with very few opportunities. Um, but uh, I think it's kind of funny. There's jokes. I, I do a lot of memes on my page and that's, I think that's why it blew up to the level it is, is just because I have uh, the ability to, uh, the willingness to make fun of the Marine Corps um, in a way that Marines relate. I don't make fun of it to make fun of it because I don't like it. I make fun of it because of the experiences that I've had in it and, and kind of love about the Marine Corps. Um, but there's a lot of humor involved uh, but one of the things that I've seen a lot of people post is like, if you were a veteran, then you either write a book or you start a clothing company. Um, so we kind of fell into that cliche, I guess. Um, I never really pictured myself to be a owner of a, a clothing company. Two other, uh, my two other partners uh, have a background in apparel. And um, so they started the company. I came on as an owner about a year, year and a half after they started the company because they needed someone to kind of help with the uh, marketing side and just kind of connect with the Marine Corps and their customers. And uh, so um, I had been doing some charity for a Marine Corps um, charity called Building Dreams for Marines. And um, that's how the other two owners found me. Um, we were at a board meeting and uh, they were looking to help that charity. And then they met me because I was doing marketing for the charity. And uh, they asked if I could help with the marketing. And it probably like six months in after helping them, they were just like, you know, let's just bring you on as one of the owners because we don't want to touch the social media side of this company. And you seem like you're all into it. So um, they kind of brought me in. And uh, so I'm now I'm one of the owners. And I've been doing that for about five years. And we grew the page from the Instagram page anyway to, uh, like I said, 63,000 followers. It's funny because I, I see a difference between the Marines on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, I think that I kind of fall in a generational gap between some of the old salty guys, which I, I start considering myself kind of salty. Now I've joined in 99 and I was in the Woodland era and the, the Iron Sights era. So that's starting to be in that old breed uh, culture, I guess. But um, the older generation that I am seem like they're, their sense of humor towards making fun of the Marine Corps is kind of lacking. Um, they take things a little more seriously than I do. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how it all came about. Yeah. Um, your uh, the, the humor you have, I, I relate to it totally as, as a Marine. I, I'm that kind of same generation. I went in 93. So I had woodlands and iron sites <laughs> and, uh, you know, all the way to around the Marine Corps, all the way to 2007, still very involved now because of what I do at, at my, at my foundation, charitable foundation, at my Oaks foundation. So I'm still very involved in the Marine Corps. I don't know if you know, but last seven years, I go speak at Marine Corps boot camp every quarter. That's at awesome. Camp. Now, I, so when you, um, when you approached me, I went and followed your page and um, I was like, how do I not know about you? 
Um, but honestly, uh, I don't consume a ton of content. I'm, I guess my wife always makes fun of me. She's like, you're a content creator. You're not a content consumer. Um, I don't spend a ton of time scrolling on Instagram. I'll just come up with something funny throughout my day. And I'll be like, this is exactly like a, a memory from the Marine Corps and I'll post it. And then um, my buddies will say, hey, check this out. And I, I get a lot of content from other people sending me stuff. But uh, I did listen to uh, one of your first podcasts and I thought it was great. And I definitely appreciated your invite. And uh, I'll be definitely uh, checking more of your stuff out for sure. Well, you know, what I was to say when I'm, when I'm, when I'm at boot camp, I'm sure you know, every, every, every quarter now for like the last seven years, like the something about what's going on there. It's, it's really as a Marine, you know, going to MCRD, the, you know, they build Marines. It's like a special moment, but yeah. I can't, it, every time I go in there, it's just so funny to me. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. It's hilarious to watch them, you know, running around in panic and the things that the drill instructors still do that I did back in 93 and you did in 99 and the things that we make, make fun of, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's so a comical. Were you going to, um, Paris Island or San Diego? I went to San Diego. Uh, my dad went to San Diego. Both my sons went to San Diego. And uh, so that's kind of a little bit, it makes me a little biased. That's where I've been speaking for the last seven years. Okay, good. This year, I'm going to Paris Island. Yeah, so <laughs> I was a Hollywood Marine myself and one of my best friends. Uh, he's part of the Mac and Clay persona that we do. Uh, he owns K Bar Soap Company. Um, yeah, that Marine Corps voice. Yeah, so we went to Paris Island together because he lives in South Carolina and we were going to do a fishing trip and we were going to Hilton Head. And so we were like, you know what, it's right next to Paris Island. Let's go see if we can get on base and go check it out. And so we did. And I was just making fun of the difference because they talk about Paris Islands or where they make the Royal Marines and Hollywood, you know, San Diego's the Hollywood Marines. Um, right. But the I have to say the Marine Corps base in uh, San Diego, I remember it being so well kept, like everything was perfect, pristine. Like, and then when we went to Paris Island, like there was grass clippings everywhere. There was trash on the ground. Clay was walking around and he dips and he's walking. And all of a sudden I watched him spit on the ground and I just let him have it. I'm like, are you kidding me? You just spit on the deck of the Hollywood grounds where you were born as a Marine. And he just like got so embarrassed. He's like, I can't believe you saw. I was like, you will never live that down. So like every time this comes up, I just be like, so spinning on the deck. All right. Yeah, San Diego is still that way. It's still so pristine. I can imagine spinning a wide bullet dip. Yeah. In San Diego. Yeah. I've actually, you know, people ask me, you know, if I see things changing. Uh, I mean, things have changed, but uh, but the that level of uh, Marine Corps perfection still seems to be in place at MCRD San Diego. I know that I have been to Paris Island, so I can't say one way or another, but at San Diego, I still see that level of perfection uh, is still there. I just met with the new CG there, and uh, you know, it's going in the hands of a great Marine, former infantry leader uh, during the invasion of Iraq, and uh, solid, solid, solid guy. So, awesome. Um, hey, uh, why, why, being a why, why machine gunner, did you pick that or did you get thrust into it? No. So originally my MOS was 0352 um, tow gunner. Um, so but then the, um, when we were spinning up to go to Iraq, they started changing anyone who's a tow gunner over to 31 because they didn't need tow gunners in Iraq. In fact, our battalion had only one tow gun um, in the whole battalion. So I went back through um, uh, MOS school, went through machine gun course and get, was cross-trained. And then when I was deployed to Iraq, I was actually a gunner. I was up in the uh, turret with the Merc 19. So I figure if uh, if you're gonna deploy with the weapon system and use the weapon system, then that makes, that's, that's your MOS that you should claim. So I don't really, yeah. originally it was a tow gunner, but I don't really like, mention that because I only shot one toe in training and that was it. Yeah, that's what I went to SOI for, for infantry school for to become a, uh, a toe gunner as well. And, you know, to, to, and then went to, I, I like picked 29 homes. So I'm like, I heard that this kind of rumor in my mind that the toughest Marines were 29 homes. So I picked 29 homes and, uh, and then I, 
I get I get sent there and I went to first tank battalion. Not okay. One of my companies and I went there and dad that total scout for two, and that's where I went. And then uh, I was there. I fired fired one, like you said, I fired one two, and uh, ended up trying out for recon and state platoon. Passed recon and dog, didn't get picked up, and then I went to state platoon uh, at seventh, seventh Bridge Regimental State Platoon for a few months, and then I ended up going to over recon from there. But uh, yes, yeah, so I never tell people I was still going to either because. I never, I didn't really do it, so I totally yeah. get that. But man, to be in Iraq with a Mark 19, that's like kind of weapon system of choice. <laughs> yes, yes. We kind of rotated a bit. Uh, originally, uh, our first couple of patrols, I had the uh, 240 Golf, um, which is also a wep- awesome weapon system. I fully enjoyed having the 240 Golf. Um, and then we rotated around. I got ended up with the Mark 19, and once I got my hands on that thing, I was like, "Yeah, this is this is my girl." So we'll stick with this. And those who are listening, to what the Mark 19 is it's a it's a it's a 40 millimeter automatic machine gun that's not you know vehicle mounted, or you put it on a tripod. But, you know, in your case, it's definitely been vehicle mounted. I don't know what the what's the second rate? How many? So I know that it shoots at 700 round or 700 feet per second. And he's like, you said, it's a, it's a 40 millimeter uh, grenade. So it's a belt fed grenade launcher and it's got a big can. You can do like 36 or 48 rounds in a can. Um, and it's, I, I don't remember the exact, I'm, I should probably haze myself for not remembering every single <laughs> nomenclature about that weapon system. But uh, yeah, it's, it's more like a thump, 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 thump kind of a fire rate. Um, and it, it's it's a very yeah, unique yeah. sound. When you hear that sound, you know it's a Mark 19. We're gonna infantry marine as a producer right now, so you can look it up. Look that look up, Will, and let us know. <laughs> yeah. It's not a great of a Mark 19. <laughs> I know from experience, it's highly effective against enemy mortar positions, I can say that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. You, you actually get to lob some rounds in, in our in our. Oh outfit. yeah, oh yeah, yep. We, uh, so we were in 04, we were, uh, patrolling um, the Sunni Triangle through uh, Iskandaria, Mamadi, Lutafia, Yusufia, um, that whole area, just uh, east of the Euphrates River. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty hot LZ for a while. Um, we were, uh, November 04, we took quite a few um, casualties. We had 99 Purple Hearts and uh, 14 of our guys we lost. Um, and um, we ended up putting 1,600 people in Abu Ghraib, I believe is what they said. Um, and then we were tasked also with, uh, that was right around the elections. And so we were tasked with security for the Iraqi elections in 04. So um, yeah, it got, it got pretty wild. It was the wild west for a while. And uh, we were actually, they said that we were actually fighting some Syrian insurgents. And you could tell the difference between, um, you know, homegrown terrorists and, and people who were just planning IEDs and uh, people who actually had training. And we scooped up some guys who had full on chest rigs. Um, they were they were setting up L-shaped ambushes with second and third tertiary fighting positions, um, indirect fire. Um, there was no joke. All right, guys, uh, I want you to visit saveourallies.org. Uh, what Save Our Allies is, it's an effort to rescue Americans and our allies that are still stuck in Afghanistan after the United States pull out. It began with me going to get my friend and his family, and it ended uh, after me and 12 of my friends went there. It ended 10 days later, where we uh, ultimately got 12,000 people out. The mission continues. We're going to continue to rescue people. And we're going to make sure that these people go from the home they lost to a new home uh, and a new beginning with a new sense of hope. We need to, we need to support this effort. Uh, we need your help. Saveourallies.org. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I haven't been to Iraq, I've been to Afghanistan eight times, actually, with, uh, with my recent things going to Afghanistan, I just went again, but uh, you know, deployed there eight times, and I know it's a lot, Iraq's a lot different than Afghanistan, and, and dealing with, you know, not just dealing with, uh, you know, like you said, local homegrown terrorists, you're dealing with Iranian special forces coming in as, a, you know, another proxy war against the United States and fighting us, and then Syrians, and all those types of people that you guys know, with, you know, no kind of stuff. But, by the way, we'll just send you this. So here's the uh, Mark 19 uh, rate of fire. Uh, rate of fire is a uh, 360 to 390 rounds per minute cyclic. 
40 rounds per minute, sustained 60 rounds per minute rapid. So you can be put out 30 to 90 rounds per minute. Uh, and uh, 750 and 790 feet per second. I got that one right. <laughs> yeah, 1,000, 1,500 meter uh, maximum effective range. Yep. The, or, or, no, uh, effective firing range, the maximum, fi maximum fire range of uh, 2,212 meters. Yep. So. yep, to 20. Yep, that's right. It's a cool, it's a cool weapon system. So. It is. Yep. Yeah, and, and when you when you uh, when you have a uh, when your unit has a budget, you get a TNE um, gives you. Uh, more precise elevation and windage adjustments. When you're a poor unit like mine, you had to freak on everything. <laughs> if you ever go to like shot show or something, if you're listening to a shot show or something like that, and you want to you know, fan, fan fire, a familiar, uh, familiarization fire weapon system, you get in line, you get in line on the team. <laughs> yeah. You get that thump. Yeah. So, so hey, when you were when you were in Iraq, like what was the what was the the mood like? It was the you know, Marine Corps in 2004 in Iraq. I know the Marine Corps is extremely motivated to go. Uh, Marines, what was the mood like? What was the, the mindset and mentality of Marines there? So our battalion commander, um, he was fantastic. Um, I actually had the unique opportunity of being part of his PSD for a while. Um, so I got to kind of travel around with the Colonel and um, listen to like firsthand experience with him meeting with uh, the higher ups, uh, being on the radio, talking to the battalion tech, talking to division and, you know, actually working with um, the other units in the uh, southern and central areas. Um, and we, you know, his his kind of vision for our battalion was this sturdy professionalism, um, no better friend, no worse any kind of thing. So. Um, he wanted to make sure that we were there to do a good job, not only to represent uh, the United States and the Marine Corps uh, as professionals, but also to think of the locals as human beings and do what we can to help them. Because um, I know that we, you know, most of us, that was our first deployment, um, first combat uh, experience at all. And, um, you know, you, you go in with each individual idea of, you know, some of us brought in this um, kill them all, let God sort them out type of mentality. Some of us came in with fear and not knowing what to expect. Um, but I think he did a good job making sure to reiterate that we were there to do a good job. Um, and then we spent a lot of time interacting with the locals. And you know, I had younger brothers at the time. Um, I have kids now, but I didn't at the time. So we interacted with uh, the Iraqi kids quite a bit, we would get extra, you know, care packages and we had more than we ever needed with care packages. So we'd drive around and like disperse stuff and we got to know the locals and by, by um, interacting with them on a personal level and trying and proving to them that we try, we're trying to help them. Um, we got a lot more Intel and a lot more positive in, interaction with them. In fact, we actually had, just as we were getting ready to leave, um, there was an army unit that was coming to take over our uh, forward operating base and they started expanding the base quite a bit and um, the uh, sh the local sheik and mullah invited our platoon to his house for dinner and he asked um, he asked the colonel how much we made as marines because he wanted to offer to pay us to say he didn't want an army unit he wanted the marine corps unit that was there to stay um, because he had experience with the army units, had a, a totally different um, uh, posture, defensive posture, where they uh, didn't really interact with the locals like we did. Um, if they got shot at, they kind of just sprayed in every direction and then got the hell out of there. Uh, whereas we, you know, um, would do a much more thorough um, satellite patrols um, and work with the locals as much as possible. We got power turned back on, we got water turned back on, we guarded the power plant, we rebuilt bridges, uh, we reopened a school in Yusufia, um, we delivered all the backpacks that Oprah was um, donating. Um, and there was one area in Yusufia where we took the, the most casualties. And this place was like the Wild West. You could, when you first rolled through there, you couldn't drive down the street without, you know, pop shots and, you know, getting shot at, um, and, the, and it was a ghost town. And then as we were getting ready to leave um, about six months into our deployment, um, you couldn't drive down the street without 
they being full of kids and uh, they were all waving and jumping up on the trucks and we'd give them candy and toys or whatever we had. And uh, so it definitely felt uh, like we were doing a good job. And I think most of us went home feeling proud of the job that we did. And we felt like we made a difference, at least in that time frame we were there. You said how, how many in that deployment, how many Purple Hearts? Uh, 99, I believe, is what they said. And you got, you, you got Purple Hearts as well. I did, yeah. So, yeah. How were you injured? So I, there was like six different incidents where I was in an explosion. Um, three of those were IEDs. Two of them were uh, mortars. And one of them was an RPG. Um, and the last of those, it happened in December 16 of 04. Um, we were coming up from a detainee run from Iskandaria or uh, Fab Kalsu, I believe actually. Um, and we were, um, doing the, there's an interchange on two of the main ASRs, Tampa and Jackson, um, going through Iraq. Uh, one goes North up towards, uh, Baghdad. The other one goes kind of up from Kuwait up to, uh, the international airport. And that interchange right there was kind of a area where we patrolled quite a bit. And uh, so we were coming down, getting off that one interchange, going south and a dump truck pulled out in front of our lead vehicle, which I was in. And um, in the uh, median was a bongo truck with they estimated about 17, 155 rounds in the back of the truck. And it detonated and blew our Humvee three lanes across the highway. And, and it was pretty amazing that it didn't roll. Um, but it, it shredded our truck um, and left a huge crater in the ground. And um, a lot of us got purple hearts from that one. No one died. Um, I was inside the truck at that point. I had swapped positions with uh, another kid who was younger. His truck was hit by an RPG and was deadlined. And he was the gunner in that truck. And he kept begging me to switch positions with him because he was bored and he wanted to get back up in the gun. So I was like, all right, there's one mission I'll let you get up. And the, of course, when I wake up, the first thing I think is he was up in the gun and he's dead. And I felt completely mortified. Um, so when I came to, you know, I remember the first thing I was asking is where he was. And they brought me around the other side of the truck and he was sitting with a poncho on with a big chunk of metal stuck out of his face and bleeding all over the place. And I was like, are you all right? And he just, he gave me the middle finger and I was like, all right, he's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, good. Oh, yes. At least Lisa's a uh, happy ending with the story that everybody's yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I was asking all that to, to ask, like, I mean, um, obviously, we all, we all have our, we all of us that have been deployed have our struggles coming home. Um, do you feel like starting, you know, being part of Left and Neck for Life, uh, you getting to vent through humor, uh, do you feel like that's been cathartic for you, like helpful in your transition? Yeah, so humor has been a huge part of my coping. I see the veteran community in general. I think we have a little bit more of a darker sense of humor. Um, and I can kind of recognize that that humor is how we kind of sometimes cope or maybe avoid some of the stuff that we're dealing with. Um, I've gone through countless hours of counseling um, to kind of learn how to not avoid those feelings and kind of hit them head on and deal with them. And sort them out and get to the root of them and try to make some adjustments if I can. Um, but I think that the humor side of it also is very, um, it's a way for us all to bond. And I think that one of the things that I realized after getting out of the Marine Corps and kind of, you know, several years later dealing with depression was missing the camaraderie and missing that um, community and brotherhood that I had in the Marine Corps, those super tight friends that you're with every single day hours and hours doing the, all the dumb shit that we did together. Um, it's hard not to be able to do that anymore. Um, so the Leatherneck for Life page, one of my main goals with that Instagram page is to give a platform for us all to kind of joke and, uh, and hang out and have that same, you know, like-minded humor together in a, in a single spot. So we do sure. lives. And we joke and I have guys on and they'll hop out. And sometimes I travel for work and I'll post on Leatherneck and I'll ask if there's any Marines in the city that I'll be in. And I've met some fantastic Marines out in different cities and had beer with them and got to know these guys. And so it's been an awesome opportunity for me to get to meet people. Um, I met Clay through Instagram and we're doing this podcast together and we're best friends. And uh, so it's it's been fantastic to ha have that page and kind of build that 
community and and uh, joke and make and make fun of the Marine Corps. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's a lot to make fun of. There's a lot to be proud of, a lot to make fun of. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people probably share uh, the content and it brings that brings them back to being people like a part of the Marine Corps by sharing those contents. You know, I've, I've shared a lot of your posts with some of my Marines. Some of them, because of my page, I'm like, I won't share that publicly, but I'm going to share it with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I know you just getting to know me, but you know, my, my I came home and struggled. Uh, you know, terribly and, and uh and you know part of you know big big part of my recovery was my faith and uh, and then starting my EOS foundation helping other, other other veterans but as we started helping other people like just being able to come to our programs and our camps that we have and get together with other like-minded veterans who are struggling with the same things and, and just uh, working through those issues together a lot of those moments have come with a lot of humor and, uh, and coming back to the like we had we one of our ranches running our program, and it's you know we do a non clinical faith based peer to peer mentoring program. But in, in that week that we're, that we're doing, uh, one of the things that guys say is like, I just haven't laughed like this in forever, like being back in the barracks, busting on each other, you know, uh, serving a scoop of, of uh, serving a scoop of butter and, and, and everybody else to one guy while everybody else has a scoop of vanilla ice cream, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, and they're laughing at them, you know, like it just just something about that, you know, camaraderie and, and, uh, and get a laugh amongst brothers that brings a, you know, an environment that healing could happen in. Yeah, for sure. In ways, but you know, that's one of the things that we've noticed that's been pretty consistent in all of our programs. And we've done you know, probably 200 of them now over the last 10 years, maybe 35 over the year. And, uh, uh now, and, uh, yes, yeah, it's something we see every time. And it's, and most of the guys are saying, hey, I just really miss that, like being around other guys and being able to laugh. So, Who's the other guy, uh, the, the vet TV guy? Yeah, pretty- I don't know them very well. So we post some videos on Instagram and Facebook and stuff or YouTube and our YouTube channel blew up when we initially started. It blew up. We were we had a million views within like two months and like 11,000 subscribers. It, it grow. And, but then we must have triggered some algorithm that YouTube didn't like. And then we got throttled pretty hard. But on one of those videos, um, the guy from vet TV messaged me and asked me to be in his videos. Um, it never ended up going anywhere. I never really was able to get in contact with him again after that, but um, yeah, it is. I see the dark humor and all that stuff. I think it is hugely important. And I, and you can see how people will go out and, and seek that kind of humor out. And I'm glad that people are out there doing it. What's your take on the culture of the Marine Corps uh, where it was, you came in and ended the nice to where it's heading now. Uh, I think culture for humankind and the Marine Corps in general both go through cycles. Um, I think the Marine Corps um, has a very rich history of warriors. Um, and I think that when those warriors are needed, I think the Marine Corps rises and um, produces warriors. And then when we're in a time of peace, I think the Marine Corps does what society does and it starts forgetting about the need for warriors and starts focusing on small, you know, issues that really aren't that important to the big picture and starts becoming soft. Um, I see that with, you know, different things where the Marine Corps just came out with, you know, these tattoo policies and dealing with COVID and masks and all these different kinds of mandates that they're kind of trying to figure out. And then you've got the don't ask, don't tell and the back and forth with, should genders be allowed to do this or that or the other thing? And, and it's, it's, these are hard issues to, to come and find solutions for. And I don't know the right answer. Um, but I think that if the Marine Corps mentality was to remain that the purpose of the Marine Corps is to be a um, combat force and anything that is combat effective should be pushed and, and fostered and anything that leads to anything less than co- being combat effective should be just disregarded or cut out. Um, and that's my belief, but I think it's hard yeah. to do that in a peaceful society. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I'm right there with you. And, you know, uh, I just love the Marine Corps. I always love the Marine Corps, but, uh, you know, it, it definitely breaks my heart when I see, you know, the, all the political garbage that goes on in our country infiltrating the Marine Corps ranks. And, uh, you know, now you're, you have commanders that are somewhat being evaluated more on, uh, on their COVID numbers than they are on combat readiness. And, uh, 
you know, it's a scary thing for our national security to see those things take place. But one thing I was you as you're talking, one thing I, I was happy to see, but it's but it's weird timing is as the wars end and now that we we're now, you know, the wars are ending and now the tattoo policy gets lifted. Right. <laughs> I heard speculation that was because they were losing Marines due to them not wanting to get vaccinated. And so they're like, all right, well, I guess you could keep your tattoos. How about that? Um, yeah. Also, I think they were hurting, hurting the recruiting because of some of this stuff. And uh, cause I was, I went down to MCRD, like I said, I go down to MCRD and uh, my youngest son Hayden, when he joined, he had to get a waiver. And uh, luckily I know a lot of people, I was able to help him get a waiver for yeah. a giant tattoo he had on his forearm, which told him not to get before he got in the Marine Corps. We took it out. <laughs> Just get a page letter, right? And he, uh, he he got it before, and so I had to pull, you know, really help him get in. But now I went down this last time to MCRD, and I see all these recruits with like these giant tattoos in their forms. Like, what's going on? Like, are you guys like they weren't handing out those waivers before? Are they like hurting on recruiting? And then like a month later, I see this fat tattoo policy change. So I think they were hurting on numbers and look, they what are some things we could change to get people one to come in and two to be able to stay in. Yeah. Uh, they're like, okay, we're going to let you have tattoos in your elbows and knees now, <laughs> which is yeah. the craziest thing. Your elbows and knees were the, were the issue. Yeah, I could I could deep dive into all my opinions about that kind of stuff for sure. Um, but like I said, I, I just think that I, I was a field Marine. I I thought the, the stuff that happened in Garrison detracted from combat effectiveness and the games that we played. And I, I think the Marine Corps does not like to see Marines bored. So that's where they introduced the games and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's to keep Marines busy so that we don't, you know, we're young kids. We join, we're 18. We don't have, we've been taken away from home. And now we've, not only do we have access to weapons <laughs> and, but we also have access to each other. And when you put a bunch of 18 year old kids with tons of testosterone and then give them a bunch of free time, I mean, inevitably, bad things are going to happen. Um, and, uh, that's, you know, the Marine Corps, you see a lot of that. Um, but the field I think is the best place for Marines is because you're kind of secluded. Um, and you spend most of your time training on the weapon system that you were supposed to be using in combat and you're focused and, um, you kind of, you get to, you know, hopefully when we were in, you know, you didn't worry, worry so much about your shave or, you know, things like that. You were more worried about, did we, hit our targets? Did we work together uh, as a team? Did we do the things that the Marine Corps wants us to do in combat? And that's what, that was my favorite time uh, being in the field, being in garrison. I think that's where the politics start becoming priority. And I think it's a waste, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. always. That's always the case. Well, uh, hey, like I said, uh, there are those listening, if you're not already following uh, Marine for Life, the left neck, left neck for life, then definitely go follow it great content uh if you want some marine corps clothing they have clothing there as well as uh you know give, give a mac a listen on a on an outside the wire podcast uh any, anything you want to plug before we, we hop off no i think you hit it all like I said mac and clay we have a page it's both of us together um my uh, um, instagram page is big and you know we're gonna we're gonna keep pushing this podcast it's talking about the same kind of things we just talked today I'm big on mental health. Uh, I went through a very dark place in my life and I think um, mental health for veterans is huge. I think just general, I think everyone should go see some sort of counselor and, and learn more about your mental health because it is, in my opinion, probably the most important thing for you. If your mind is strong, then everything else will follow. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking a lot more about that on my podcast and uh, yeah, I, I definitely appreciate you having me on. Um, but hey guys, thanks for listening. Uh, Matt, thanks for coming on. And uh, we'll catch you guys next week.